Yeah, so I'm a farm advisor on the central coast of California, and uh, hopefully what I talk about today is going to relate a lot to what was talked about this morning about water scarcity, and, uh, and then we'll add in nitrogen management. Yeah, so, you know, two big issues we have in, on the central coast and, and in Arizona and um, other places in the west is, of course, water management. Uh, and there's a lot of drivers for better water management as well as better nitrogen management. They're both really important um, uh, inputs in, in growing the crops we grow. And, um, you know, one of the main reasons we want to do it, of course, is to optimize our yield and our quality. Um, but there's other factors, um, restrictions and water use, and we've been talking about the Colorado River. Uh, on the central coast, where I'm from, we have water quality regulations uh, because of nitrate contamination of the groundwater. And more and more uh, companies that are buying the products we grow, they're demanding sustainability metrics. And they want to know both water and nitrogen are managed as efficiently as possible. And they want proof of that. So this is um, a map of the central coast where I work. And uh, this is data of nitrate concentrations in the groundwater there. Now, unlike other parts of California, where we have surface water supplies that come from uh, the snowpack up in the Sierras, Central Coast is isolated. We rely 100% on groundwater. And everything that we capture from the rainstorms that we get in the winter, we try to infiltrate in the ground to replenish our supply. And not only do we use groundwater for agriculture, but we're using it for drinking water. And so there's a lot of places on the coast where the nitrate concentrations are above the uh, federal standard for drinking water of 10 parts per million nitrate nitrogen. And those concentrations are going up. About a third of our ag wells are above uh, 10 parts per million um, nitrate, nitrate and in the water. So with uh, more restrictions in nitrogen fertilizer use for agriculture, uh, growers are going to have to really reduce the amount of fertilizer they're applying in the future. And we have now targets and limits on the application rates of nitrogen fertilizer. So what goes on in the coast often starts spreading in other parts of the state and could end up getting into other states in the West where you do rely on groundwater for drinking water. So growers are going to have to take into account uh, other sources of nitrogen that are helping the crop grow, like the residual mineral N in the soil that might be just background levels when you plant. Of course, the nitrogen in our irrigation water and uh, mineralization that happens from the soil amendments, you know, organic amendments you add to the soil or previous crop residues. And a key to managing nitrogen, I think as Raj was saying, is good water management because very quickly as nitrogen, you know, mineralizes into nitrate in the soil, it becomes very uh, mobile, just like uh, another salt, like chloride or, or sodium in the soil. So where the water goes, uh, nitrate's going to go. So I know we've talked a lot about, um, you know, using AI and all sorts of uh, mapping you can do. But what I'll be talking about are just two pretty simple tools that growers can use. And really the challenge of the project we've been working on is how do you get these two tools, the soil nitrate quick test, and weather-based irrigation scheduling based on ET in the hands of growing, growers so they actually make use of these tools. Because we find that often, you know, there's so many other things going on on the farm that growers don't pay attention to, um, you know, water and nitrogen as carefully as they could. So if you're not familiar with the soil nitrate quick test, it's a very simple way you can assess uh, nitrate concentration in your soil. 
using these strips in an extractant solution. And I included a QR code, so if you want to read about it uh, and how, you know, what materials to buy to do the test, uh, you can. Um, but assessing the, the soil nitrogen is only one part, and we also have to look at the demand side of the crop for nitrogen. And so if we look at some of these demand curves, you see there's a period in the crop when the nitrogen demand is quite low, and so we don't need to apply so much nitrogen, and then it increases uh, quite rapidly as that crop you know, gets closer to harvest. And this case is an example with lettuce. Uh, once we get about halfway through the crop, uh, its N uptake rate is about three to four pounds of N per acre per day. So with weather-based uh, irrigation scheduling, you know, ET-based irrigation scheduling, what we're really talking about is taking the reference ET number and adjusting it with a crop coefficient to estimate uh, the, the water demand of the crop. And uh, as Andy was showing uh, earlier, um, you know, it, there's these uh, published values in FAO 56. Now, when I began working over in the Salinas Valley, ask growers, are you using ET for irrigation scheduling? Over and over they say, no. I said, why? Well, we don't know what the crop coefficients are. And, you know, um, the crop's always changing every day. So our approach was, well, these lettuce crops are very consistent in their growth pattern. So if we can model the canopy development, uh, we can actually sort of model how that crop coefficient would change over the season. Okay, so we went to a lot of commercial fields, took pictures, analyzed them and we developed these models and not just for lettuce but all the different vegetable crops we have but we realized you know getting the crop coefficients one thing getting the reference et is another thing but there's still more calculations you still have to sum up you know what is the crop et from five days ago to the day you want to irrigate you have to adjust for the application uniformity you have to adjust for a leaching fraction if you're going to apply that. And then most importantly, we have to convert it to an hours of run time. So all these things are calculations. And, um, you know, whether you're trying to figure out what's the right nitrogen rate to apply based in, on the uptake rate of your crop and the soil nitrate in your soil or figuring out the ET, all these things are calculations which are time consuming for growers. And uh, with vegetable fields, there's a lot of small vegetable plantings of 10, 15 acres, many different types of vegetables. So it becomes really complicated to make decisions on what is the right amount of water, what's the right amount of fertilizer to apply. And so growers tend to use their, their experience. Uh, and there's other decisions and activities to coordinate. So that was the rationale to develop an online application that growers could use as decision support. That's what we call crop manage. And it's specific for water and nitrogen management. Uh, it's meant to be in the hands of growers and help them with decision support and providing uh, site-specific recommendations uh, for irrigation nitrogen management based on the soil type they're on, uh, the climate they have, that local climate, the crop type, and the development stage of the crop. And one of the things about it is it's using all the science we've developed in the universities, at research stations, in trying to make it available and simple to use decision support tools. It also can help grower keep records of what they're doing on water and nutrient management, important for exporting for uh, regulatory compliance, but also for just looking at the history of what you did. What was it you did you know, when you got a, a really good crop, or what is it you did with the water or the nitrogen 
when the crop didn't turn out so well. So you can have all those records. You can look at what your average fertilizer rate is of nitrogen. So we began uh, developing crop manage for lettuce and uh, Luckily, we didn't call it lettuce managed because we expanded it to other commodities. So we have artichoke, broccoli, cabbage, uh, carrot, cauliflower, so all these different vegetables on it, including um, some berry crops now, raspberry and strawberry. And then we expanded into tree crops, almond, walnut, pistachio, and field crops. And one that should be quite important is uh, alfalfa, because uh, we've talked about that today. So uh, steps to using CropManage, quite simple. It's, it works in a web browser, so you just go to that website. Uh, you establish a, a user login. It's free to use. You set up your farm, or we call it a ranch, um, and then you set up plantings in that farm. Um, and then you add different events called soil tests, like the soil nitrate quick test, fertilizer, or irrigation. I'll just do a real quick uh, demo. Let's see if I can stop this. And show. And I just want to show, you know, it's really simple to use. So once you establish uh, your different fields here, and I'll just use broccoli as an example, and it works very nicely on the phone. So if I want to add an event, say an irrigation event, I just click here, irrigation, and let's put it for maybe tomorrow, and this would be uh, in the Salinas Valley. Do a sprinkler irrigation, I calculate it, and you get a recommendation. Now, you wonder, okay, where'd that recommendation come from? Well, we explain it. So here's your average uh, reference ET, the crop coefficient we're using, we have a distribution uniformity, and there's the days since your last uh, irrigation. No leaching requirement and no precipitation since six days ago, and we even show you where the data is com coming from. So then I can create that, and it becomes a task for an irrigator to act on. So I'll just stop that and restart here. Okay, so um, what Simis, what CropManage does is it accesses the reference ET automatically for the grower. So you choose your weather stations you want to use. And part of this project that we've been talking about today was to get ASMED into CropManage. So it's freely available to use. Um, and something I'd like to discuss later if we have time is just getting more participation from my colleagues here in Arizona in getting it, you know, really adapted for Arizona conditions. Uh, you have options to use multiple weather stations. In California, we can use the Spatial Simis product, which is a satellite hybrid of weather station and satellite information. And it has historical ETO, so we use that for future irrigations. If you're looking in advance, you know, and you want to make a schedule, you can do it. Uh, and we hope to access um, Open ET, Reference ET, which is a gridded map for the whole West. So that's coming. Now, the nice thing about it being a web application is we can make use of other web products out there. And one of them that we use is um, the SIMS, the Satellite Irrigation Management Support. Now, we don't use it for estimating ET, we use it to get an estimate of fractional cover of our crops. So once you set your crop in the field, you know, and give and point where it is, it crop manager will automatically bring in estimates of uh, fractional cover or canopy cover, which helps you adjust our canopy model that we have in there. So this is an example um, for say this is lettuce here, and the blue line here is um, our modeled canopy cover. And you see, hopefully, these green um, 
symbols, those are ground measurements of canopy cover. And all these black dots are estimates of canopy cover that come in from SIMS. So that's just all automatic. And then the user can adjust these variables um, to get this curve to match. And then you just have a better you know, sort of estimate of what the ET is for your crop. And then when we use crop manage, often we want verification of what's going on in the field. And so we can bring in sensor data. So we can uh, put a flow meter on an irrigation block and by connecting it with a data logger, automatically bring in uh, all the irrigation applications. Uh, we can put in tensiometers or volumetric soil moisture sensors and also connect that to a data logger and bring it in. So something else I think is unique about uh, what we've been doing with Crop Manage is, you know, there's a lot of commercial software you can buy um, out there, and I think uh, Elias, Elia was explaining there's so many different commercial companies. But what we try to do is make sure these algorithms are accurate. And so we've trialed Crop Manage pretty extensively, doing replicated trials in in uh, the research station on all these different vegetables, uh, some in participation with Driscoll's. We did it on their, um, for strawberry and raspberry at their research farm. And the trials usually are uh, applying water at different rates from 50% of what crop manager recommends to 150%. And this is an example with uh, cabbage and you can see just following crop manage at 100% or applying 150%. This is the yellow treatment. They look pretty similar. But we go beyond that and measure yield. And uh, here's the 50%, 7,500, 125 and 150. And so there's no statistical difference once we get up to 100%. So that's what we like to see. It, it confirms our algorithms seem to be working well. Sometimes they don't, and we have to make adjustments. An example was celery. We found uh, at first 100%, it just doesn't maximize yield. The other way uh, we use crop manage is for on-farm demonstrations. So we can hook up that flow meter. Um, in this case, this is a celery field, and have the grower follow we can use it in, in several ways. We can assess what their current practices are in water and nitrogen management um, and identify what they can try to improve. Maybe it's the nitrogen management, maybe it's the water. Uh, we can experiment with different strategies the grower's interested in in trying and get that feedback and see what they're doing. Of course, then the grower participates by evaluating the yield. And sometimes we use it for training the grower's staff. So he said, well, I never can convince these guys you know, to irrigate how I want, so let's work together on this. And so we can give feedback to their, their um, field staff. And this is an example, um, a grower we were working with, he was growing um, green cabbage here. So here's the crop manager recommendation, cumulatively over time, and this is the grower, he did what he felt comfortable with, and then at the end he, he started applying extra water. He said he, he didn't know why he did, but he just felt more comfortable doing that. And that that's fine. And it's like, how is the yield? He said it was very good. So, you know, using it successively, you know, with different crops, they get more confidence in, in the tool. So you can't just say, Here's a tool, use it and believe it. No, they have to convince themselves. The nitrogen recommendation model sort of works this way for the vegetables, where we um, say do the soil nitrate quick test and we compare it to a threshold value. We also look at uh, the future in uptake. So if we're gonna fertilize in, um, and, and uh, it's been 10 days since we last fertilized, we might um, see what the uptake is based on our model. Say here it's 40 pounds. And then we give credit for um, residual soil nitrogen 
above the threshold that's in the soil. So 20 parts per million we, we assume is very sufficient for lettuce when it's at that phase where it has a high uptake rate of nitrogen. And then we subtract off um, for this, the nitrogen in the soil, uh, nitrogen in the water, and we get a recommendation for the nitrogen in the fertilizer. So it's really a nitrogen budget from fertilizer application to fertilizer application. So over the years, we've run many side-by-side -side strip trials with growers with, the, with this approach. And what you're seeing here is the red is the grower uh, rate versus the blue. And these are 20 different trials um, in fertilizer. So this is just in lettuce, but um, our growers standard was averaged out to 150 pounds versus 104 pounds, you know, over all these trials. So it's a 47 pound reduction or 31%. And actually we know that on average, our growers have been applying more nitrogen fertilizer than 150 pounds um, because they report to the water quality board about 170 pounds per acre for, for growing a lettuce crop. Um, some of the growers were interested in trying to reduce um, their nitrogen and we had cases where we had really high nitrate irrigation water and so even the grower greatly reduced uh, you know their fertilizer application because they felt comfortable to do that at when we were doing the trials together. In terms of yield of those 20 trials we actually got higher yield. It was statistically significant if you consider each site a rep. So 107% on average of the, um, compared to the grower standard. So you might ask, well, how interested are growers in using this type of tool? And there's definitely interest out there. We, up to date, we have had over 3,300 3, user accounts made and more than 3,000 branches set up on there, and lots of plantings, and uh, crop managers received 15,000 soil nitrate samples. Uh, it's given uh, 80,000 recommendations, um, both water and fertilizer recommendations. So it's been used over the last decade since it was established. And what we're doing now is just expanding it um, to additional commodities. So we've been working with vineyards, uh, Asian vegetables, we'd like to get more agronomic crops in there. And part of this project was we'd like to bring salinity management in. So I'm looking at you, Elia. Uh, and uh, there's a real interest in having um, the ability to predict mineralization from organic fertilizers that might be used. And so we've been working also on the help side of crop manage. And uh, one area I need to do a lot more work on are having some very easy to follow uh, YouTube videos on how to utilize crop manage. And we've been trying to add uh, more task management to it. So uh, just to summarize, you know, what I think crop manage does is it repackages our research results that we do at the university into simple to use decision support tools is de designed to support growers and crop consultants in water and in, in nitrogen management. And we're pursuing opportunities to expand it to additional comp, uh, commodities and regions and give it new features. So if you're interested uh, to learn more, just try it out. Uh, there's help links and you can give comments. Uh, you can contact me if you have any questions. Uh, yeah called the Crop Managed Hotline, which is my number. So with that, I'd uh, be happy to answer questions or if you want to discuss anything. Any questions for Michael? Yes, Robert has one. <laughs> it's kind of a joint one for you two. So, <laughs> there's a, one being worked on in Arizona that's the water-wise, ag-wise. Yeah, that's, that doesn't have a nitrogen recommendation with the Is that how it will be separated. What are some things that you're looking at here in the desert that may not uh, we, fit into uh, crop manage? We are primarily concerned with water and salts. Salts is paramount importance. I'm going to talk next. I want to stress that point. That was very important to us. 
there is, there'll be some limitations to our model, but I'll, I'll define those. Do you have anything to add, Andy? On the water-wise? Well, we'll have more to discuss when you're <laughs> Jay, what's up? Is, is this available for someone outside the country? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you could use it outside the country. The, the issue is, you know, the models have to be adjusted for how you grow uh, the crop in a different region. And the other thing is, you can put in your own ET data, your own rainfall data, so you can just hand put it in. But it's not going to bring in your weather station data automatically. We would have to set that up. And we have done it, uh, I've worked with the University of Hawaii, and um, they set up their weather stations, and we were able to bring their data in. But, but following up on Jay's comment, the fact that yours allows verifying growth states with uh, satellite NDDI, perhaps that would, that would help normalize crop coefficient applications somewhat. Yeah. Yeah, and so it, it really allows you know, the user to take the existing model and, um, and then get the satellite data. Because I, but I'm not sure SIMS works outside of the US. I'm not sure. But you could know. do that. But you could but, get the NDVI from uh, Sentinel. Yeah, it'd be more complicated. But in the future, you know, <laughs> maybe that's an option. But whether your latest crop's a 70-day crop or a 130-day crop, the NDVI will help you normalize that. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. Let's give Michael a hand. So let's, the f point I want to make is Dr. French has talked about ET and college talked about ET. But there are other non-beneficial uses of water that are paramount. And here I've outlined a few climate modification, land prep, resident decomposition, and a few touched on distribution uniformity. This is very important. I could talk about this as well. But we're going to focus today on salt management because sustainability in our systems requires effective salt management. And I want to partition two things. The first thing we're concerned with is the general osmotic effect of salts. Plants have to expend more energy to draw up water against uh, this osmotic gradient. And essentially, that, that's energy diverted from growth and production. There's other things. There's specific toxicities, nutrient availability. Uh, these are generally not of prevailing importance. But I'm going to talk later about sodium. And we're not concerned about the toxic effects of sodium. We're concerned about how sodium destroys cell structure. And that's very important. And I'm going to stress that. Now, there's different ways we monitor the salinity in the water. We can measure the EC of the saturated paste extract. We have a, an array of sensors to measure bulk conductance and algorithms to convert bulk conductance to ECE estimates. And for field application, we typically yield field conductance. And I have two instruments here in tandem. We don't use them this way. But the first one is uh, a sensor that a grower might use or a fertilizer company that's offering this service might use. The second one's an AM38. It's a research-grade instrument. That's what, that's we're, what we're using for most of our, our studies. studies. But, but I, I just want to distinguish between the two because the virus is something a, a grower might use or a, or a consultant or a fertilizer company that provides this service to growers. And you can see the steps followed. Uh, this is a, a program developed by the Salinity Laboratory. It's called ESAP. We do a survey based on the conductance. We develop a sampling plan. We take the samples from that sampling plan, bring them back to our lab, uh, report the results, and then do mapping. And this particular software uh, allows for all of this. I, I think Lee updated me. They are making it, they're converting, updating it for Windows 10 and 12, although Right now, we're tricking it into running in Windows 10. Has anything changed? Or? No, no, no. <laughs> Not yet? OK. Uh, there's emerging technologies. There's these air instruments that you can fly over, either with large aircrafts or even UAVs that measure conductance. I haven't tried any of these. And my colleague Pedro is playing with these sensors that actually have an array of sensors, uh, ref they, uh, spectrometers and conductance, and can integrate a lot of things. So. 
the future is bright. There's emerging sensors, but in the meantime, we, we don't have to wait around for the perfect sensor. There's tools we can use today. Now, how do we manage salts? There's no magic elixir for salts. We use leaching. And we're using steady state mass balance. Is steady state accurate? I'll show you in a minute. It's not. But what's the alternative? I, as a researcher, I've used transient models. I've published with transient models. But as a practitioner, I don't have the database to drive transient models over the scope of all the fields I have. Maybe AI will help us do that. Transient models don't give you a required leaching. You do a lot of simulations, and then you pick a scenario that best fits your situation. But the limitation is not that. We can then generate databases, store databases, and, and manage them. The limitation is I don't have the data to run the simulations. I don't have Gapone exchange constants. I don't have KSAT over the full scope and range of soils that I, as a practitioner, have to make recommendations for. So we use steady state mass balance. And here's the cruel reality of it all. The more saline our irrigation water is, the more water we have to use for sustainability. Our required leaching goes up as the salt concentration of our water goes up. And I mentioned that steady state models don't work. Uh, I mean, they, they work, but they're not perfect. Why aren't they? It's because of the carbonate chemistry in our soils. Our soils have carbonates, our waters has carbonates. When you have carbonates, you can precipitate out your salts, and this confounds the whole issue. And you can see the different cations and anions we're talking about. These are from soils in Yuma. It shows what's in the Colorado River water. And then I show the range in soil water. And you can see the various salinity ion species that, that we typically encounter. And this is some data. This is from nine spinach studies I did, but I could have showed you data from lettuce or salad or broccoli or cauliflower. You can see we exceed the KSP of a number of carbonate and sulfate minerals. So the steady state assumptions aren't valid. Do they have consequence? And I'll address that here shortly. But you can see we are getting precipitation, but concurrently we can get dissolution. But the other point I want to make is we're getting no precipitation of chloride, of chloride minerals. minerals. So, so someone, someone earlier, earlier talked, talked about, about how we can track leaching with chloride. That's a good way to keep our ECE measurements honest. A little bit about sodium. Sodium's a different bird altogether. Beyond the osmotic effect to plants, sodium destroys soil structure. Now, if you look in your textbook, it'll tell you over 13 is a sodic soil, under 13 is not. It's not that simple. Uh, there's a gradation here. On some soils, depending on texture, uh, SAR of 6 can adversely impact infiltration. So we characterize it by a figure like this. You'll see this figure again as I put it in context of some real world data I'll be using. Now, in addition to the traditional sodium absorption ratio, we like to use the adjusted sodium absorption ratio. That takes into account the propensity for carbonates in our water to precipitate calcium, thus enhancing the sodium absorption ratio. But a third indice we call the cation ratio stability constant weights in potassium and magnesium. It, it recognized the reality that, like sodium, potassium is a deflocculator, but not a deflocculator to the same degree. And it recognizes the reality that magnesium, while a flocculator, does not flocculate to the same degree calcium does. So what weights potassium and magnesium? And when you deal with situations where you have a lot of magnesium in your water, this is the indice to use. The, the cross indices. Now we'll get to the meat of the presentation. Let's talk about our challenges. One of them is salt management challenges are going to increase. Most climate change models, the Bureau of Reclamation's own slope model, everything predicts that the salinity and the rivers are going to increase over the next two or three decades. Here's some data I collected, actually. actually this, is, this is about 10 years old. I was studying pharmacy pharmaceuticals in the river. I traveled up and down the full chain of the river. And I, because I had the water samples, I ran them through my lab and ran different things. And you can see the EC of the water, and you can see the sodium absorption ratio of the water. And you can see the constant. This is the whole chain of the Colorado River from Grand Lake, Colorado, to Morello's Diversion Dam. And you can see some of these tributaries 
are higher than the main stem. Green is usually a little lower. Green freshens up the Colorado River again when they come together in canyon lands. But the point I want to make is, depending where our runoff's going to come, how snowmelt's going to impact it, we can see how there's a propensity for this to change over the years. Now here's, and you've got to give the Bureau of Reclamation and their partners, including the USGS, the NRCS, the seven basin states, a lot of credit. The salinity mitigation program has worked excellent. You can see how they've reduced the, the salinity in the river. And here's three sampling points, Hoover, Parker, and Imperial, since 1972. And these thresholds, these dash lines were set in 1972. So the Bureau of Reclamation and their federal and state partners have done an incredible job mitigating the saline in the river. They've plugged up saline seeps in the upper basin. They've lined canals that would seep and, and, and run drainage water through manco shells. They've done a lot of things to mitigate the salinity. But for various reasons, they anticipate that it's going to increase over the next few years. Now, this is based on the Bureau of Reclamation slowed model. Like any model, there's uncertainties, and you can see the, the, the range of uncertainties here. The solid lines represent their mean. The shaded areas represent their 10th to 90th percentile of that mean. So depending on things, they can't quite capture. The, the increase may be slightly, or it may take us back to pre-1972 levels. And the different scenarios represent the Bureau of Reclamation doesn't know to what extent Congress is going to continue to appropriate money for salt mitigation, so they created alternative funding scenarios. And you can see the range of possibilities as we move into the next three decades on their anticipated increase in salinity. And again, reiterating the cruel reality, higher salt means we have to use more water for sustainability. Our leaching requirement goes up. Now, this shows the Colorado River in relation to the sodium risk. And we're right on the threshold, whether you use the SAR, the adjusted SAR of the cross, we're right on the threshold. So the point I want to make, we're okay. We don't use gypsum and Yuma uh, because the Colorado River SAR is good. However, if, if the footprint of any tributary relative to the main stem changes, you can see how, how vulnerable we are to potential sodium, sodium issues, issues if the fingerprint of the chemical constituents changes even so subtly. Now, the second challenge I want to make is improvements in irrigation efficiency will enhance the need for salinity management. When we're inefficient, our leaching requirement is incidental to our inefficiency. And we're improving efficiency. Uh, Dee has talked about these programs. Growers can apply for money. We'll help them buy this, help them buy that. There's a lot of pressure. CAP has programs. There's USDA programs coming down the pipeline that'll do much the same thing. There's incentives for growers to be more efficient. They're going to be more efficient. And as we become more efficient, we have to keep salt management on our radar screen because our le required leaching was often incidental to our inefficiencies. It won't be as we move forward. And to exemplify this, I'm going to talk about the vegetable industry in Yuma, which have become efficient over the past three years. And full disclosure, not for altruistic reasons, they did it because produce is as sensitive to over-irrigation as under-irrigation, and these are incredibly efficient systems. And as a result, salt management is front and center in some of the decision process. This is a typical system in Yuma. Year-round production, high-value crops, then it switches over to a spring crop, and then you have this summer, and our salt balance is restored with a pre-irrigation in that period. That's because we've gotten efficient all season. This has enabled us to manage our nitrogen better. We don't leach out our herbicides like curb and prefar. Uh, we don't leach out our imidacloprid, but we're having some salt accumulation through the season, and we have to do our pre-irrigation. And one of the reasons uh, of the the app that, as Bryn brought up, that, that Andy and I are part of, is to help them calculate what this leaching requirement pre-irrigation will be, what it should be. Now, a few things about efficiency. One of the big things that happened many years ago 
And actually this was implemented for climate modifications. We went from subbing up produce to sprinklers. This was for climate modification. This was so we could get lettuce and broccoli and cauliflower up when it was hot. But the reality is we've saved boatloads of water here. In the old days, we ran water on the furrows for days, sometimes over a week. Steady state infiltration on a typical human soil is about five inches a day. So you can see we could use two feet of water to establish a crop. With sprinklers, we're probably using five inches or less. In fact, I can show you. This is a typical sprinkler irrigation event. It has sensors throughout the bed. The blue lines at the bottom represent when the sprinklers are run. You can see after 24 hours, we barely feel the profile. You can see the successive layers fill up. And then we just wet it in the middle of the day after that, just till we get a fully established stem. But as a, as a consequence of this, this is a salt increasing management practices. You can look at the, the, re, the required leaching, you can just look at the leaching fraction we see, and you can see the salt accumulation in metric tons per hectare and at 30 and 45 centimeters. And it doesn't stop here. We go into the main season, and Dr. Zerin may have shared some of this. This is a result of some of our modeling. You can look at our manipulation of flow and cutoff, and you can see how we can achieve efficiencies uh, over 80%. And because our intake rates of our soil low, our distribution uniformities are equally as good. And this was based on modeling. But is this true? Well, more recently, Dr. French shared with you, oops, what did I do wrong? Dr. French shared with you our actual measurements of water use efficiency. We're measuring irrigation input, we're measuring ET, and Measured efficiencies range from 60 to 100 percent, but the average is well over 80 percent, which is important because our required leaching for lettuce is 20 percent by steady state mass balance assumptions. And all our land will get lettuce over a three year period. So 20 percent is what we work with. So you can see that that summer pre irrigation is of paramount importance, and this app hopefully can track it, and growers can use what is required and not more than what's required. This just shows more of the salt increase. First, fig, first is the field, the lettuce field. This is the field white salt distribution before lettuce. This is after the lettuce crop is over. This is wheat. Before wheat, after wheat. You can see in many of these scenarios, we're having a consistent salt increase. Looking at our database, which is very large now, as our leaching fraction drops below 20%, we consistently see salt increases across these fields. And you, they can compound themselves over a rotation. This shows lettuce, wheat. You can see it went up with lettuce and it went up with wheat. So that pre-irrigation in the summer becomes of becomes paramount importance to sustainability. This is lettuce watermelons. We increased with lettuce, then we increased further with watermelons that were grown after the lettuce crop. Uh, and this just summarizes some of that data. You can see, and again, I have ECE and I have chloride and saturation paste extract. You can see a clear majority of our cropping systems are salt loading events within the main and rotational crops. <coughs> and I show this I data, data just, just to make the point that as you get efficient, salt irrigation has to take into consideration your salt management criteria. And that was the second point I made. What did I do here? And again, this is the app that we have. Uh, we, we, we're not work, we don't have anything like Michael asked for end management. We can call a water irrigation. Uh, and we can track a leaching requirement deficit across the season. Third item, and this is important here in Pinal and Maricopa County, loss of surface water allocations will result in increased use of groundwater. And most of this groundwater, not all of it, but most of it is of inferior quality to the surface water we use. Here's some data I have here from Central Arizona. The first case is what this, what's being diverted from the Colorado River through the CAP Canal at the Brady Pump Station. The second are several wells, 26 wells in the Katy Irrigation District. The last one is 15 wells in the Maricopa. Stanfield Irrigation District, and you can see the change, the, the ranges in EC, adjusted ACR, and cross. 
most of this groundwater is of inferior quality to surface water. So you'll have to make some salt management de decisions, adjust your leaching requirement, but more problematic is the sodium risk. Almost all these wells put you in a zone where you're going to have infiltration problems and you're going to make a sodic soil over time if you don't mitigate it. Probably the least expensive thing to do is treat your water. But alternatively, you can use soil amendments such as elemental sulfur or gypsum. But you can see the challenges as people who traditionally got CAP water up the, the Santa Rosa through the Brady pump station are now using source groundwater. You can see they're going to have to manage or they're going to destroy their soils with sodium. Finally, one probable short-term consequence of water cutbacks will be changes in cropping systems that will impact so many management decisions. And I'm just going to give one example here because of time, but the Bard Water District in the Yuma area has taken money from the Los Angeles Metropolitan Water District to not grow a summer crop. And the Los Angeles Metropolitan Water District would get this water that's not diverted in the summer. Dr. French and I went and put an eddy covariance system in these fallow fields. You can see there's evaporation in these fallow fields. The soil, the water gets in the immediate surface, dries out, then it reaches an equilibrium with the water table. So evaporation, there's no crop here, it's not transpiration, evaporation continues over the entire period. Now, the groundwater, the shallow groundwater was much, much more saline, saline than the surface water. water. So you have water moving up by capillarity, you can surmise that you're accumulating salts, and indeed you are. The first figures before summer fallow, the seconds after. We increased salt by about two decisiemens per meter. Uh, this is going to require a leaching fraction, a large one, to restore salt balance. Again, this is an unintended consequence of making some management decisions without looking at all the ramifications. And there's one final point I want to make on this. The shallow groundwater in Yuma is different than the surface water. And the shallow groundwater, what did I do? The shallow groundwater probably is going to give you a sodium problem because sodium is more it's mobile than calcium. So what's coming up with this capillary movement is more likely going to be sodium. So here, you could have a sodium challenge that you have to deal with, even in addition to your salinity challenge. So I think that's all I have to say today. First of all, salinity monitoring and management challenges in the irrigated Southwest are gonna increase. We have them, they should not be ignored, but they're gonna increase. We do have some tools, and we have uh, technology and tools to, to manage these challenges. However, we're currently developing more technologies and data fusion tools, as well as sensors, to help better manage this into the future. That's all I have to say. Uh, we'll answer any questions before I introduce the next speaker. Okay, well, thank you all. So we talked about um, irrigation management. I wanted to uh, deliver water just enough for the crop to grow, um, but we have problems with salinity. Uh, so you want to put the water where it matters uh, indeed, but then you don't want to accumulate salts too much. Uh, when you put nitrogen in, you want to put it where the roots are, are going to be and not beyond the roots, because otherwise it's uh, uh, a lost, uh, uh, application. So this is a very complex matter. And uh, one of the pieces of information that help um, the water manager growers doing these decisions, as well, you know, the uh, decision support tools are soil maps that give you the information about that specific field has these properties and therefore you should uh, uh, apply water in, the, in this way if you have this criteria in mind. So 
we look at a little bit of a comparison between um, what's available out there, what uh, you know sensing technologies can provide to improve uh, knowledge about soils, and as well a little bit on how with the project we are um, collecting data and then try to improve available soil maps with the uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we. I showed this, this map earlier already, uh, and because uh, I, I, I like I like to show it, this uh, this rule of thumb and the Raj was uh, Kosla was mentioning about it as well. Uh, that across the landscape you will see that there's a lot of variability, but what's important is most times uh, around 50% of the variability is uh, um, um, due to soil spatial variability. Um, the other 50 percent, as I mentioned earlier, is like a very complex interaction between the weather and the management and, and so on. Uh, but if you really want to do the precision agriculture um, approach of uh, you know knowing what you're doing, where, and then uh, deciding when and uh, using the right sources and so, and, and so on, uh, you really need to have a good understanding of what your spatial variability is, what this, the environmental system that you're working with. So when you talk about soil, and I'm like uh, you said, like uh, you go back to the basics, I'm going back even even more, even even more than that. Uh, soil is a very complex, uh, you know, container for our plants uh, and water and, and agricultural inputs. There are several properties that are very important for uh, crop growth, uh, but perhaps like the ones that are most relevant to um, uh, water management are the physical soil properties, and in particular. Uh, one of the, the, the uh, uh, again, with structure and, and others, like one of the important properties is soil texture. So like, you know, how much sand, silt and, and clay you have in your soil. And that's uh, important because, again, together with texture and other properties, uh, uh, together with the soil structure and other properties, that's what determines what, uh, how much water the soil can hold. So, um, what is the uh, water holding capacity, the maximum amount of water that uh, a soil can hold and that it can be made available for the plant. So we have two different graphs here that tell the same story. We, some other speaker talk about this today as well. Um, you know, if you see the soil as a bucket, you can fill it up. If you go beyond the fill capacity to saturation, you're going to lose that water for lower profiles in the, in the, in the, in the soil uh, column. But this water is going to be available to the plant up to the wilting point, and after that, is not uh, the plants are not be able, be going to be able to, to extract it. So, having this piece of information is very, very important to decide not only uh, you know wh when you decide when and uh, and how, how much water that you're going to need for the next week or so, or to replace the water that you lost through past evapotranspiration. You need to have this understanding of how much water your soil can hold so that you can decide, okay, I need to put in this much water, but I need to do it in this much time because otherwise I'm going to put water beyond my root zone and that's not gonna be uh, uh, beneficial for my practice. So, um, the other piece of information here is uh, um, that, that is available and we are collecting is the uh, saturation percentage of a soil, which is a very cheap measurement uh, that is done routinely for the salinity measurements, but it's very uh, um, relevant here because it's uh, very uh, strictly uh, correlated to clay content. And the saturation percentage is the uh, weight of water needed to saturate a soil uh, sample divided by the dry uh, weight of the soil. And as you see, depending on the region where you're at, you have a very, very good correlation between the saturation percentage that is a very cheap measurement to the clay content. That is a more expensive measure, measurement. And this ties up, uh, again, you can measurement, uh, measure the available water co contact uh, on the soil, very expensive to measure. Uh, it relates to the texture and other soil property. Texture is a little bit cheaper to measure. And then again, the saturation percentage that is uh, the cheapest of the measurements. So there is a relationship that goes across the measurements. Uh, it's uh, often site specific, so it, it doesn't make sense to build a relationship for uh, your single field. But one of the things that we are trying to do with this project is uh, collecting this data across different regions from the Salinas Valley to, to Arizona to Colorado to see if we can actually build a, 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 um, a relationship there to, with, with machine learning to 
go from very cheap measurements to, to, to more expensive measurements. And that's one of the pieces of the information that, that, are, that, are, um, uh, that can be determined then uh, with, the, with, the, with field sampling. So um, why are the high resolution maps uh, useful? Uh, they allow you to improve the accuracy in estimating the uh, soil water holding capacity, as we said. Uh, then you can better identify the soil spatial variability. Then once you have this type of information, you can design your water application systems. And I like to put this uh, 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 graph here from an uh, uh, irrigation engineer friend of mine in, uh, uh, in Chile. They do this on a, daily ba like on, on, on a standard basis. They do the soil maps for, for orchards. Uh, for vine uh, and vineyards there, and they do the irrigation uh, uh, setup that follows the soil water holding capacity. And ideally, if you follow everything uh, uh, and, and it's uh, uh, done properly, you can reduce the, the input costs. So we said this is ideal information to have. Are, is the information out there? There is the very uh, uh, valuable information that is uh, the uh, web soil survey from the USDA and RCS that is uh, presenting um, soil maps for the entire uh, United States. These are like incredible uh, repository for, of information. There's a, a link of some of the maps that I'm going to show there that is accessible from like the Cal, uh, soil, Ca California Soil Resource Lab uh, of UC Davis. It, it allows to browse the soil maps very easily. Um, these are very, very uh, accurate at the broad spatial scale, but what's, uh, um, what about at the uh, field scale, what, uh, what we are uh, caring about when we do, doing irrigation management? So this is um, uh, uh, you know, a, a screenshot of the uh, um, UCR Agricultural Experimental Station, and you can see that uh, there are uh, several mapping units, and uh, you could tell, okay, we, have, we even have like sm small plots in there, and you can have several units uh, uh, with a, within a single field. Uh, but those units, as we'll see, uh, may, not, may or may not be very accurate if, in terms of, uh, of the actual soil spatial variability. But when we compare this to you know, field-wide uh, and across like, uh, the, the entire state of California, we can confirm with the laboratory analysis that we did that actually uh, Sergo data is uh, fairly accurate uh, on the average level. So if you want the average properties for your field, uh, you're pretty much on point when, when you're using Sergo. If you want the information at the subfield level, uh, that, th th they're not that accurate. But they were not meant to, 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 to do that in the first place. So if you want to go to high resolution, uh, the approach to take is uh, uh, as uh, Charles uh, Sanchez was uh, talking about, or I was talking, Kosla was talking about, is to use um, on-the-go sensing and other sensor platforms that allow you to characterize spatial variability of soil properties. In my lab, uh, we use a, a, a variety of these soil sensors. We've been doing uh, some surveys at uh, Crete and uh, Yuma and uh, Salinas Valley with uh, a blend of uh, high accuracy GPS, gamma ray, uh, e uh, electromagnetic induction instruments. <clears throat> Today we're going to look at the, uh, uh, some of the apparent electrical conductivity data, uh, which relates uh, to uh, like a variety of soil properties. Uh, it's a very complex measurement. But um, when you don't have much uh, salt salinity in the soil, uh, generally, it's used as a proxy for characterizing uh, texture. So you would have like low measurement with uh, high sand and low clay, high measurements with uh, high clay and, and low sand. And this is, a, oh, I lost a map. There, there should be a map there with, uh, um, with ECA across a field. Uh, it's very easy to mobilize. In, uh, in a day, you can do a handful of, of fields, and you can have like a lot of data for, for a single field. Uh, we're going to see a little bit more later. So. We went to Yuma last year. We did a, a survey for 10 fields, and we do the, a lot of soil sampling because, of course, this is like a, if you don't validate it with, the, with soil sampling, this is just a qualitative type of uh, analysis. Uh, so let's look at a, this qualitative comparison between the spatial patterns of the sensor measurements and what uh, Sergo maps look like, uh, and talk about the implications for soil texture. So we're going to look at the ECA maps on the right and then the Sergo maps on the left. 
the uh, range that you see for ECA is for the entire Yuma Valley. We measure from like uh, 0 0.11 to 0 0.84, the Siemens per meter of ECA. Generally speaking, uh, at the 0 0.10 mark, you are on a very like a soil with a, with a high sand content, 10-15% uh, of clay, and you go to uh, high clay uh, high clay values, 50% uh, uh, all around there with uh, with the uh, ECA around uh, 80 and, and 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 more than that. So you can see, we're going to see a few cases where the spatial patterns tend to match, where the spatial patterns don't don't, don't match, uh, and you know just just for for the awareness of it. Uh, because as I, like my point be, behind all of this is that all the maps that you're seeing these from Sergo are the maps that companies are utilizing in their decision support nowadays. So they sell farmers their decision supports uh, and, are and they are like soil specific, but they are based on maps that might or, or may or not uh, match what the, uh, the realities in the fields. So this is a case where actually Sergo uh, um, matches quite well with the spatial variability of the, of the, of the crop. Uh, although <clears throat> the value for, for clay content tend to be uh, a little bit overestimated in, the, in, in Sorgo, uh, for, for, in my opinion, we haven't validated this yet with the soil analysis that are undergoing. Uh, but you capture very well the spatial variability when the pattern is, uh, has a fairly long um, uh, spatial range. When you go to fields that have uh, variability in a shorter range, you tend to uh, not see quite a, quite a, a, as a good of a match, uh, as well as variabilities that are not uh, not as uh, remarkable as the ones that you were showing before. So this is another field. You have three mapping units, and really on the ECA maps, you have like that one corner that has uh, a high clay content, and the rest is uh, fairly fairly uniform. Whereas, uh, you know, in these two fields, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty pretty interesting. Um, you have uh, short-scale spatial variability that is not captured by, um, by uh, Sergo, but what's important is that this short-scale variability is kind of remarkable because you go from very low sensor values to very high sensor values and with well-defined patterns in a, in a very short span. And, and, and these are fields that most likely uh, are going to be, if you manage it as, a, as an average, where you're going to lose a lot of uh, water and nutrients in the, in the sandier areas because of that. And there's another comparison over here where you have like short scale spatial variability, uh, not too remarkable variability, but still is not uh, captured at all from the circle maps. So up to now I showed just like the uh, raw uh, sensor measurements, but really as uh, uh, Charles Sanchez was uh, uh, pointing at, you need to calibrate these sensors with this actual soil, uh, uh, the sensor maps with actual soil samples at the field scale uh, to convert the sensor maps to the actual soil property that you're trying to map. And this is the protocol that goes behind the ESAP software that uh, uh, Charles Sanchez was talking about. Uh, you go out and measure uh, tens and, uh, uh, or thousands of, 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 of locations with your sensor. Uh, that creates your map, gives you a spatial variability. That spatial variability can guide you to sample only few uh, locations, and you take those soils to the lab. Then there's a statistical model that converts the sensor to the actual soil property, and this is a case for salinity in Southern California. And then you can estimate salinity across the field. And basically, this is the process behind what are the salinity maps that uh, Charles Sanchez were, was talking about. So you can do this for salinity, or you can do this for uh, uh, water holding capacity. And this is uh, one of the fields at the, our experimental station at uh, uh, Riverside. We did uh, 3.5 acres, we did the sensor survey, then we did the soil sampling, and then I'm going to show you a sand content map and the available water content map versus the, uh, uh, the Sergo units. So <clears throat> as you can see, there's a rem remarkable difference in uh, available water content for, uh, for the uh, topsoil here. And Excuse me. And uh, uh, it's quite different from what, what is uh, reported by, uh, by the circle map. So obviously, having that type of information would be very beneficial for uh, water management and to make more informed decisions, uh, of course. So how can I access these, uh, um, these uh, high resolution soil maps? Um, there's a, a few strategies, right? Like, uh, and the problem is that there are some bottlenecks 
one is the high cost because uh, you um, either if you are like a uh, a public entity that's trying to do these maps or a, a farmer that is hiring for uh, like a consultant to do the maps, it, it tends to be a very, uh, very expensive uh, to do so at the moment, as well as you need a lot of technical expertise to interpret and create these models that convert sensor maps to actual soil properties. Um, so one of the way to go for it is to get uh, tr like soil sampling services uh, and they do either like traditional soil mapping with uh, one core per acre uh, which tra like somehow is uh, not sufficient as uh, Raj Kozla was uh, talking about before or uh, the, like other companies are uh, um, doing on the go soil sampling and then soil sensing and then uh, pairing that with sampling but <clears throat> The point is there, though, is that they go do the soil maps and then they go to the farmers and they just show the soil maps. And one of the things that I haven't talked about uh, yet, yet uh, is the error that are associated with these, all these models. Because I'm, I'm saying these sensors are very complex measurements, but then you want like one value that, that the farmer needs to use for, for the irrigation management. And it's a statistical process, and we know that with statistics there's an error associated with uh, so, one thing that we are doing is uh, uh, using legacy data from past exper experiments, new data that is collected, to try to tie all this sensor measurement to satellite data to provide high resolution soil maps that are kind of uh, reshaping the surgo maps, but associating an error to, 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 to the maps as well. Uh, so, this is the, uh, like the, the preliminary pr uh, product that we have that uh, is so far uh, doing, doing quite okay. It was is developed by Duke University and Nate Cheney that is uh, part of the team. And then we are trying to um, complement this with uh, uh, spaceborne remote sensing. And you start from the data collection uh, to uh, do the big part of uh, the training data and, uh, and, and, and make the uh, the model, so like you need to identify what are the variables that are most important, and that's like kind of like the bottleneck with the, with the uh, machine learning uh, of remote sensing at the moment, because you have so much data, but that only maybe just a subset of it is very meaningful for you to to create models that are that are that are worth it. And then the important thing is to identify what is the error of the maps and also validate it extensively with the independent data, and then. Finally, and only finally, once everything, all the, all the ground is covered, you can uh, publish the soil maps. So the first step that we, that we are doing is to take the hundreds of fields where we have these uh, surveys and, uh, and the soil sampling, and then harmonizing them all together, and then building model that can, models that can estimate other field scale, like your, say in this case, salinity map and the error of the prediction. And then the next step that I wish I can come and talk to you in a, in a couple of years, uh, hopefully, is that w once we have these maps at the hundreds and hundreds of fields, we can use it to tie all the remote sensing data to uh, have a better high resolution product uh, uh, that, uh, that is going to leverage the, the good part of Sergo, but, uh, but uh, make it uh, match with the actual spatial variability that is observed at the field scale. And, so we are, we are in the process of collecting a lot of data. We've done all the yellow stars so far, and uh, it, the plan is to uh, um, increase the data set by adding those three other areas. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, that's about it. We, we are like basically in the, pro in the process of, of collecting a, a lot of this data. But ideally, the, the take home messages that I would like to, uh, to leave with, uh, you guys today with is that maps can help you to make informed decisions about irrigation, fertilization, salinity management, and land use planning. Uh, when assessing public maps or hiring consultants to produ produce new maps, be aware of the following. The data quality that uh, the maps were created with, the scale and the resolution. So Sergo is very accurate at the field scale and landscape scale, but like uh, at the higher resolution is not accurate. So you want to make sure that if you hire someone to make a map, that you understand the, the scale that they are making the, the product uh, at, and uh, and uh, uh, and of course that they, that if you hire someone or using maps from public repositories, you understand the uh, the, the use that they were uh, um, uh, the ideal 
objectives that they were made with or that, that you have maps made with the objectives uh, in mind that, that, that you want to have. So if you want to irrigate, you need to hire someone to make a map that will give you the information that you need to, to make uh, informed decision, uh, decision making uh, with water management. And always ask for what is the error behind it. And that's about it. Okay, well, any questions for Aaliyah? I want your opinion on something. I, I have Mike, I have Mike. It's an <laughs> easy question to start with. Okay. Uh, the friendly crowd first. <laughs> So there's a, it's a whole presentation by itself, but the, uh, what we are observing more and more is that we um, can, you don't want to take a single image of the satellite because that's going to tell you like maybe like how the plant is doing, like a lot of information. But if, when you're try, starting to look at multi-year uh, time series analysis, you can look at the peak of vegetation, the minimum of vegetation, how fast the crop grows, and those uh, variables, when extracted, tend to relate to uh, uh, stable soil properties quite, quite a bit. So if you're looking over multiple years, so you try to uh, get rid of transient effects of like, you know, weather or management or other things, then you can highlight the uh, more permanent features in, in the landscape, which is often the soil properties. And the thing, though, is that you need to do that if you have the soil information to match that multi-year temporal analysis with. Because this, that's going to change by region, maybe like the, the soil type, and, uh, and so on. So it, you really need to tie it down a, a, in a data-driven way to what your local data sets look like. So the idea is we go to a region, we came to Salinas, we do multiple fields, in a sparse way, that gives you some spatial variability. You can use that information to then train the, se the, the satellite sensors for that region. So you can take Sergo, say these soil units are more or less correct, but the border is not quite there. It should be there, and it should have this pattern instead. I want your opinion, and I'm not talking about Salini, because Salini, I, I look at conductance more as a, as a research tool. Mm -hmm. But on the variable rate fertilizer management part, I, use, I look at it as a management tool. Mm -hmm. And when I collect this data and I do the math, and you mentioned the expense of this, I estimate it costs about $90 an acre to do those surveys. Mm -hmm. I don't know if your numbers are different. Well, no, but but I'm... the only way I can make that math work is if I can amateurize out that survey more than one year. And I'm yeah. not interested in salinity, I'm only interested in texture, because texture is driving nitrogen leaching, yeah. so that's driving that phosphate fixation. So can I amortize that, that survey out 10 years? So, is the, like, are the soil sensor measurements stable over time? That's the, basically the question. When, you're, when you partition out the texture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for, allows yeah. us to partition yeah, out yeah. so many texture, moisture. So, um, it depends on the target soil, uh, soil, soil, soil property. So salinity tends to be an influencing factor on the measurements that we talked about today. Other measurements like the gamma ray spectrometry doesn't, is not influenced by salinity. The bare soil imagery is not influenced by salinity to a certain extent. But what is the trick behind um, uh, like this type of measurements that you need the agronomic knowledge of what you're trying to do? So if you're trying to use it for texture, you want to use it when you know that there's not as much salinity in there. So after a rain, after a, a leaching event, and, and you want to use that so that you minimize the influence of salinity in your uh, spatial variability. Because then, <clears throat> these are sensors, but they are magic in phys physical properties, right? So salinity is a component, water content is a component, uh, texture is a component, and other soil properties are also like influencing the, the, the measurement. But if you minimize the salinity in the system, you level the, the, the water content because you try to do everything at field capacity, then the major driver of the spatial variability for the sensor is going to be what's left, and most likely it's going to be texture. And as a matter of fact, in the East Coast where they have no salinity problem, they routinely use this for texture proxy. And they stopped even like calibrating in most cases because they see that 
for a region. We take these samples yeah. to our lab and we measure yeah. SP and we measure EC and we measure moisture. Mm -hmm. And ESAP theoretically, statistically partitions those. That's not good enough. No, no, yeah, it is. And that's not going to give us the that, that texture signal we for yeah. the Is that good enough? I think so, yes. Then that's not a problem. So how long can I use that map? Ten years, five years? Well, well so if you mean if you made sure to minimize this, the, the effect of uh, soil salinity, then you can that, the, unless there's a major modification of soil spatial variability for whatever reason, you should use that map for as long as the, 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 the you expect the, the clay to be. The survey is going to cost ninety dollars an acre. Yeah, no, no, but you and, can use it for multiple well, years. Soil samples yeah. are going to cost me a couple of hundred dollars an acre. Mm -hmm. So my fertilizer savings from a variable rate application, the only way it can pencil out is if I can amortize yeah. that survey out several years. So if you look at the, the spatial variability, uh, you know, and temporal variability of uh, of soil properties, they say salinity matter of like months to years. But texture really okay. is for tens of years, right? So I, I think that you, you can change the texture with irrigation, with like, and then like there's going to be erosion and such. But the not scale, fast. yeah, not not as fast. So you can can you use this? And as a matter of fact, there's several publications. We have data as well that shows that repeated measurements show the same spatial patterns, even with salinity, as a matter of fact. But, so yeah, you can use it for multiple years. Robert has a question. So two things. One, uh, Bobby McDermott dropped off a lot of the soil maps that they did at uh, RCS way back in the day. I don't know if you want them. If you want them, you got them just in boxes, just sitting there down at the extension office. I don't know if you want to cross-reference them. If you want them, they're there. But second off, what about laser leveling? I mean, if we're laser leveling the field, aren't we just mixing it all around? Yeah, yeah. So th th it, it is true. So. The thing is, <clears throat> that's one of the components that are going to mix up the, the texture, especially in the topsoil, like soil surface, quite a bit. So you can expect some error to build up, but you're using uh, management zones that have like a certain sp like, uh, spatial range that hopefully that, that is not going to cause a, an issue. But if you repeat it for multiple years, then of course, like maybe after five, six, seven, se seven years or so, then you need to double check and do another survey. But in the short term, these maps are very stable. If there's no other questions, let's give a lead a hand. We made it to the end of the day. <laughs>